Hoy contamos con el profesor Theodore Rapp, que en la actualidad es profesor emérito de Historia de la Universidad de Princeton, centro en el que ha impartido clases desde el año 67. Igualmente ha sido docente en las prestigiosas universidades de Stanford, Harvard y Johns Hopkins. Como investigador y especialista en Historia Moderna Europea, ha publicado importantes libros en los que combina la erudición científica y la destreza literaria, entre ellos eh, destacar Enterprise and Empire en el 67, The New History en el 82 o Renaissance Lies en el 93. En concreto, sobre este periodo, sobre el Renacimiento, ha hecho también un programa de televisión eh, titulado Renacimiento, que fue nominado para un Emmy, fue el, el consultor histórico de este, de este programa. En nuestro país está traducido El hambre en la historia, en el, eh, en el año 90, eh, por la editorial Siglo XXI. Es articulista también en los eh, más prestigiosos periódicos, como The New York Times o The Washington Post, y tanto por su labor docente como por su aportación humanística, ha sido premiado con numerosos galardones, destacando los de las fundaciones Delmas, Ford y Guggenheim. Eh, la conferencia de hoy se titula Vínculos de la cultura europea, reflexiones sobre el arte flamenco y dará una visión global en conjunto, aproximándonos desde el punto de vista del historiador, no del historiador del arte, a las fronteras culturales y al microcosmos de relaciones económicas y sociales que se establecieron entre ambos países. Muchas gracias. Let me first say how honored I feel to be speaking in this place, uh, one of the very greatest museums in the world, a place that I've loved ever since coming here for the first time many years ago, uh, and a, an extraordinary collection uh, that I think nurtures everyone who comes to it. It's one of the great glories of Spain. You're very, very lucky to have it. I'm going to try today to take a look at the entire subject that has been made the center of this course. I'm not going to focus on any one period. I'm not going to focus on any one artist. I'm not going to focus on any one patron. What I'd like to do is to give a sense of how a historian looking at the phenomenon of this extraordinary accumulation of Flemish art in Spain gives us an insight into the nature of European culture and indeed even of European politics. The quite astonishing fact from which one must start is that there are some 1,100 Flemish paintings in the Prado Museum alone. That is a quite staggering number. It means that it is impossible to study Flemish art or to understand anything about Flemish art and its influence elsewhere in Europe without coming to the Prado, without coming to Spain. And of course, those 1,100 paintings are just a portion of the works of art by Flemings, paintings, tapestries, sculptures, buildings that you will find throughout Spain. There's nothing quite like this anywhere else in Europe for this period, or indeed, as far as I can tell, for any other period. And the question the historian has to ask is why? Why did this extraordinary exchange take place? Why was it that Flemings coming from a tiny part of Europe, very, very far away, over a thousand miles away, should have had such an enormous presence here in this distant country? What does this all mean? I start from a recent tendency in the history of art to play down the importance of indigenous, individual, local commitments to the arts. There's been a great deal of work in recent years
on something that has been called the geo-history of art. I'm very sorry to use a technical term. I have no choice. That's what they want to call it, and that's what I have to do. What those who write about the geo-history of art are determined to do is to blur the edges, is to, is to reduce the concentration on individual schools of art in different countries of Europe. To the non-art historian like myself, that seems like just another attempt to turn history or art history on its head uh, and to set off in new directions by saying that everything that came before doesn't make sense anymore. There is no Dutch school. There's nothing specific about German art, nothing specific about Venetian or Florentine art. Now, it is quite clear that some of the ways those local schools have been described has not made a great deal of sense. There has been, as the people interested in the geohistory of art have regularly pointed out, there's been an excessive emphasis on geography, on something in the topography, maybe something in the water, maybe something in the air that makes people in one part of Europe paint rather differently from people in another part of Europe. And especially, of course, in the days of the Renaissance, the Baroque, the period we're looking at, a period when travel was difficult and there wasn't easy communication. And you didn't have, as you are beginning to have now, really an international style in a great deal of art. There have been a number of very important studies of the influence of the expansion of individual local schools into other places. Uh, the connection between the Northerners and the Italians, for instance, has been explored in a number of directions, not only how the Italians influenced the North, famous example, of course, of Dürer, who came twice to Venice, and how he was changed by that experience, but also the other direction. There was a wonderful exhibition at the Palazzo Grassi in Venice a few years ago, which was quite deliberately trying to show how the influence worked in both directions as well. There are those who say that neither the Florentines nor the Venetians were quite as distinctive as they seem, and that there was a great deal more interaction between them than is normally thought of. Uh, there are clearly individual styles. The mansard roof is unmistakably French. That's where it began. And wherever you see it, it's clear that someone is imitating a French style. But very often, it seems to me that the attempt to minimize the notion of distinct, distinctive, easily recognizable individual schools is a kind of reaction against Italy by those outside Italy. Uh, there is no question that the Italians were immensely influential, and the effort to downplay distinctiveness is a, a, a kind of effort to suggest that no one area has a monopoly or even a claim to distinctiveness more than any other. In some ways, of course, the same is true of Flemish art, which is the other great distinctive art of the late Middle Ages, enormously influential, which spread throughout Europe in many ways, and is particularly influential in Central Europe. There are Flemish influences that go even into that other great center, into Italy. And yet, to suggest that there is nothing distinctive about the Flemings, because their influence, their reflections, are felt so far and wide, is, I think, to downplay what is recognizable and what is therefore important in a particular art form.
the power of local traditions, of schools, of training, of artists preparing the next generation again and again and again is absolutely unmistakable. It is true that the talk of some kind of geographic influence or even of a linguistic influence may be overdone, but the distinctiveness must remain nevertheless. Anyone with any kind of introduction to the history of art can spot the difference between a Flemish painting and an Italian painting of the same period almost instantaneously. And it was very interesting that when Desmond Shaw Taylor and Jennifer Scott prepared a wonderful exhibition in London of the Queen's Flemish pictures just a few months ago in the Queen's Gallery, I think the exhibition may still be going or, or, or be ending very shortly. I noticed that there is a Spanish edition of that catalog available here in Madrid. When they came to look at the Flemish works in the Queen's collection, their first question was to ask, what is distinctive about Flemish art? It's very difficult to define, of course. You feel it, but how can you put it down on paper? Their attempt, however, was really quite elaborate and I think essentially successful. That there are certain elements in Flemish art that are utterly recognizable. There are certain ways of doing landscapes. Uh, the great pioneer of that way of doing landscapes, Patinia, was the subject of a wonderful exhibition here at the Prado quite recently. And his high perspective with a distant horizon as a way of doing landscape became a profound influence throughout European history, but there's no getting away from the fact that originally that way of doing a landscape was entirely and really quite specifically Flemish. The aerial view, the interest in a kind of documentary representation of daily life is something the Flemings did far more intensively uh, and more effectively, I think, than any other uh, school of painting. Their emphasis on peasant scenes, their portraits which uh, Shaw and Scott call uh, reportage portraits are, again, a perfect example of this kind of local individual ca character which then may be transmitted elsewhere but is unmistakably Flemish to start with. And from the very first, therefore, I think Flemish art from the earliest days of its greatness, from the 14th and 15th centuries on, its individual character can be seen. Okay. So, if you accept my basic argument that the origins are clear, then the question is, is there nevertheless a European-wide absorption of what the Flemings did uh, and uh, embrace by others uh, even distant traditions of what the Flemings have done? And here the answer has to be taken above all from Spain. Because Spain is the emblematic instance. Spain is the place where you can see how enormously far a particular way of doing art can travel, how powerful it can be, the impact it can have, the influence uh, that remains for a very long time to come. Spain is not only just about as far away from Flanders as you can go in Europe. I mean, there are bits of Poland, I suppose, which are just about as far, and there's been some recent work to show Flemish influence over there as well. But certainly, it was a very long and not very easy trip. But the place they came to, namely Spain, is, of course, the hybrid nation. The whole of Spanish historiography is full of the notion of Spain as the one great culture, the one great polity in all of Europe that has been shaped by at least three traditions. The standard account 
tries to unravel or to understand the homogeneity that is created by the three great religions, all of whom flourished in Spain in the late Middle Ages, the Arab, the Jewish, and the Christian. How did they come together to shape a quite distinctive nation uh, on the European com uh, con uh, continent? There is no other country which has so remorselessly explored this notion of a combination of the openness to, to the other, of a creation uh, of distinct parts into a new and very different whole. It caused all kinds of problems, of course. I'm certainly not going to go into those. But the notion of mixture, the first great melting pot, there is no question that it is Spain. And the same is true, unmistakably, powerfully, in the world of art. And this is not just the local diffusion that some of the geo-historians have talked about. Uh, certainly, it's clear that Italy influences its neighboring areas and goes up into northern Europe. <clears throat> it's certainly clear that the Flemings influence Germany, which is right next door. This is an absorption, not only of the culture of Italy, which is, after all, a fellow Mediterranean neighbor, but of Flanders, which is at least a 1,000 miles away from most places in Spain, and which is powerfully, constantly present in Spanish art for centuries to come. Well, how does it happen? What I'd like to do now is to take a look at the stages by which this process takes place, the stages by which this extraordinary presence gets felt within Spain itself. It begins in the reign of John II of Castile. John II of Castile, who reigns in the 15th century, dies in 1454, has not had a very good press from Spaniards, not had a very good press from anybody. He's often dismissed as a rather weak king, which I suppose he was. He's completely overshadowed by his famous daughter, Isabella. Uh, and so John tends to shrink into the background and never gets a great deal of attention in histories of Spain. But in one respect, he is an absolutely crucial monarch because it is John's love of Flemish art that starts a great tradition in Spain. Without John II, I suspect the subject that we're talking about tonight, the subject that has been looked at from many angles during this series of lectures, simply would not exist. Why John loved Flemish art? We don't know. The evidence is, unfortunately, far too distant, far too fragmentary. But that he did love Flemish art, there can be no question. And the presence in Spain of the great artists who were creating the Flemish Renaissance during his lifetime uh, is entirely, in my view, a result of his interest, his encouragement, his patronage, and the inducement to others at the Spanish court, at the higher levels of Spanish society, uh, to do the same. I'm going to give you just a few examples of some of the great works of John's contemporaries that are, in fact, just across the way in the Prado itself. The oldest of them, Roger Campion, uh, this marvelous picture of John the Baptist uh, with uh, a Franciscan in front of him. Uh, it was, uh, this is of course a far larger reproduction than the original. Uh, it's a marvelous depiction of that concave mirror, another one of the great favorites of the Flemings, and if you want to 
emphasized the distinctiveness of Flemish art in the 15th century. The number of mirrors in their paintings is another way of doing that. And we can all understand, of course, why John would have liked uh, Campion's work, uh, but the fact that it had to travel the great long distance it did is what is so significant. Campion is perhaps less famous than his two uh, younger contemporaries, um, Roger van der Weyden and Jan van Eyck. And there are, of course, famous examples of their work just across <clears throat> in the Prado as well. Here is a van der Weyden Madonna, again, much bigger than the original. Absolutely stunning picture, uh, the color, the devotion. And one suspects that it was the devoutness that particularly appealed to John II, but that is pure speculation. Uh, the famous descent from the cross, uh, the, the power that van der Weyden uh, infuses this subject, the marvelous depictions of the individuals, the emotions, the responses they have to the work is clearly something uh, that John and his contemporaries felt very strongly. <clears throat> and uh, finally, uh, the great altarpiece that van der Weyden uh, prepared for Mira Flores uh, is uh, an example of precisely the kind of grandeur of conception, the ability to take a huge subject and place it before the viewer. Uh, it is a painting which, if indeed hung as an altarpiece, would have absorbed an entire congregation week after week uh, with a look at its details. <clears throat> His contemporary, Jan van Eyck, uh, the uh, remarkable fountain of life, which again uh, is just across the way now in the Prado. <clears throat> but even a painting which is not here in Spain is an example once more of this powerful influence in John II's reign. The Arnolfini wedding was a painting commissioned by a representative of the Medici, by an Italian, living in Flanders. It was a painting which you'll see the, the concave mirror in the back again, of course. Uh, it is a painting that is taken as an example of the interaction between the, between the Italians and the Flemings. But very, very early on in its life, it is now in the National Gallery in London, very early on in its life, it was owned by a Spaniard, Felipe de Guevara. And so once again, this evidence of the appeal of the Flemings, of Spaniards being drawn to Flemish art, is there from the very earliest days. And I'll finish off with <clears throat> three more paintings from the gallery, uh, Memling's marvelous virgin with that wonderful depiction of the flowers uh, on the ground behind her and around her, uh, his uh, uh, remarkable altarpiece, this is just the central section of it, in Nahera, and <clears throat> the great polyptic of the virgin by Dirk Boots, which is here again in the Prado. These are all examples, and they're just a few examples, of the Flemish paintings which came here during this first generation. This first generation uh, before and around the middle of the 15th century, when this connection <clears throat> with Flanders was established, there was an ability of the Flemish to capture devoutness, I think, and to capture the precision of portraits, which had an enormous appeal here in Spain. How did they get here, and how did they get used? The center of the exchange, I think there is no question whatsoever. And had it not existed, again, this story might not have been possible, <clears throat> is the fact that Spain was the site of one of the greatest fairs 
of the 15th and indeed even later centuries, the fair at Medina del Campo. This was a genuinely European fair. It lasted, if you can believe such a thing, for 100 days. For more than three months, merchants from all over Europe would gather at Medina del Campo. And the single largest group of these merchants came from Bruges, which was the greatest, uh, the richest city in the Netherlands at this time. <clears throat> the reason was simple. Spain was perhaps the greatest source of wool, of very fine wool, anywhere in Europe. And Flanders was the greatest producer of cloth, of finishing the wool, also anywhere in Europe. The Italians might think differently, but I think uh, the Spanish and Flemish claim to leadership in this area uh, is pretty well established. That's why those merchants from Bruges came to Medina del Campo. This is where they got their wool. <clears throat> this is where they made their deals. And the largest group of merchants in Spain who came to <clears throat> uh, the fair were the merchants from the nearby town uh, of Burgos, maybe not the largest, but certainly a very substantial portion of the merchants there. And of course, they were great uh, uh, purveyors of wool. And what I suspect is that they were getting quite a bit of art in return. There were, moreover, very important Spanish merchants who went to the Netherlands. It was a two-way traffic here, and where, again, Spaniards would have had the chance to see the art that was being produced locally and bring it back to Spain. So this is the site, and this is the time when this entire extraordinary exchange really got underway. <clears throat> and it got a huge boost under John II's daughter, Isabella, uh, Isabel la Católica, the Queen of Castile and later Queen of Spain. Because for Isabella, this interest, we can only call it an, inter an interest just because we don't have any more evidence about it. But with Isabella, it became a fundamental commitment. She made herself and the aristocrats around her made huge purchases of Flemish art at Medina del Campo. And it is really in her reign that the entire notion of Spanish art, deservedly being called Hispano-Flemish art, really takes hold. Isabella surrounded herself with Flemings, painters, architects, sculptors, experts in the creation of stained glass, the fashioners of choir stalls, uh, people who essentially were sculptors of wood, uh, the makers of tapestries. And there's been, on this subject, of course, quite a bit of literature. This is so large a part of Isabella's reign, so essential to an understanding of her patronage, her cultural interests, that people have begun to explore what it was about Flemish art that appealed to Isabella. The easy assumption, especially when you talk about devotion and devoutness as an element in Flemish art that appealed to the Spaniards, would be to assume that one of the great spiritual movements that arose in Flanders in the 15th century, namely the devotio moderna, the modern devotion, a very spiritual uh, kind of uh, treatment of the Christian tradition, a tradition which is shaped by the advocates of the devotio moderna in ways that some have seen as the ultimate origins of the Reformation, it certainly influenced Erasmus a great deal. But it's been shown, I think, quite rightly, that that's not what really, really what Isabella was interested in. Her kind of devoutness was of a much stricter, simpler, traditional, rigorous kind. Uh, and yet, that too, the Flemings 
obviously were able to satisfy. She loves their style. She loves the kind of painting that they do. And she, there are real attractions for the Flemings that she offers. The major one was that in Flanders, every artist had to be a member of a guild. He had to be subject to all kinds of regulations, all kinds of taxes, in order to pursue his art. In Spain, Isabella waves that. Tax havens are not a new idea. They go back at least to the 15th century. And what Isabella does is to remove all guild demands on artists, on the Flemish artists, or formal regulations that they would have had to observe back home in Flanders, and she gives them tax breaks in order to make it even more attractive to come to Spain. It is not insignificant that 11 out of the 19 hospitals that were erected on the pilgrim's route to Santiago de Compostela, out of the 19 hospitals, 11 were built by Flemish confraternities. There is an encouragement, there is an inducement, there's a willingness to bring the Flemings, to use them as essential to the culture of Spain, which is entirely associated here with Isabella's interests and is, gets and gives. What she does is to give what she inherited from her father, a huge boost to make Flemish art not merely appreciated and loved, but absolutely central to the art of Spain. <clears throat> and the people she brings to her court are indeed from Flanders. Here is a work by one of them, Juan de Flanders, uh, John, same name as her father, who comes from Flanders, uh, is a member of her court, is paid by Isabella. Uh, this wonderful portrait of a girl bringing the, this devotion to precision, the, you know, the wonderful folds in the dress, everything so precisely envisioned, which is something that uh, clearly Isabella was very fond of. The devotional pictures, here's another one from just across the way here, uh, the raising of Lazarus, <clears throat> a close-up depiction here with all kinds of infusions. I really don't want to go into them. I'm not an art historian, but there are so many of the novelties of the art of the time that are brought to bear here as you come really close to see the moment when uh, Jesus raises Lazarus from the tomb. She is a patron also of Quentin Massis. Here you have his uh, remarkable presentation of Christ. Uh, again, the, uh, the color, the detail, the focus, the devoutness, obviously very important. And even people who essentially spend their lives in Spain, such as Pedro Berruguete, who here you see in a self-portrait, marvelously vivid self-portrait, uh, is deeply, profoundly influenced. The hat comes straight up out of Van Eyck. Um, the, the, the willingness of the Spanish artists to absorb the culture that has come from so far away. And it's not, of course, only in painting. One of the <coughs> most powerful presences in Spain during Isabella's reign is Hanekin Egas, who comes from Flanders, who is responsible for the great tower on the left in the cathedral at Toledo. Um, and Egas and a number of his family and colleagues create the extraordinary chapel of Santiago uh, within the cathedral at Toledo as well. Um, Juan Guas, another one of these Flemish imports, uh, turns his attention to other kinds of architecture. And one of the great uh, attractions, tourist attractions certainly in Spain, the wonderful Manzanares Castle uh, 
is his work. And here you have the Hispano-Flemish style absolutely embodied. The sculptor Gil Siloe, uh, a wonderful alabaster depiction uh, of St. Joseph. And he, uh, with perhaps help from others in the Burgos Cathedral, created this extraordinary tomb for John II and his wife uh, that was commissioned and was created during Isabella's reign uh, as a tribute to her father and mother. And I could go on. There are many other examples. Uh, a marvelous uh, depiction by Felipe Vigarni, uh, polychrome depiction of Isabel's husband, Ferdinand of Aragon. <coughs> Is Isabella and Ferdinand's successor, Charles V, was, of course, himself a Fleming. He was born in Ghent, and so it's absolutely natural. The case is made. You don't need any further explanation in some ways. But I would really put Charles into the tradition of what his ancestors had already been doing in Spain. And in some ways, it now makes sense that it is Charles who's bringing the Flemings here. But the irony is that it is in Charles's reign that the Italian influence is first really powerfully felt in Spain. And in some ways, I think you could say that Charles is more interested in having the influence of Italy visible than he is in his native uh, Flanders. It's not that he was so vastly popular in Flanders. They thought that he uh, spent too little time there. And when his uh, 500th anniversary was being uh, celebrated, the way that the people of Ghent, his hometown, commemorated his birth was by putting up on their walls a list of all the people whom he'd had executed in Ghent. So the relationship was not exactly uh, very close. But nevertheless, Charles V did patronize, just like his ancestors did, some of the leading figures of Flemish art at the time. Here is a portrait done of him by Bernard van Orley. Uh, this is a, one of a great series of tapestries of Charles V on horseback that Bernard van Orley uh, designed. Uh, this is another Dutch, uh, excuse me, Flemish a tapestry maker, Willem de Panamaka, who created this wonderful tapestry, which Charles carried with him everywhere of his arms. It would be hung in his tent whenever he traveled, and Charles was constantly roaming all over Europe. Here's another tapestry that Orly um, uh, designed, the Battle of Pavia, one of Charles V's uh, great triumphs. But there were even other not so obvious uh, Flemish uh, painters who were brought, whose works at least were brought to Spain. Uh, here we have Marinus van Remersveil. You will see that picture uh, again across the street uh, uh, in the next building, uh, the extraordinary tax collectors. Not, I would have thought, a subject a monarch would want to have around, but still, there it is. Uh, Lesser artists, too. Michael Coxey, whose death of Abel was again purchased at this time. Juan de Juni, uh, really wonderful uh, polychrome Pietà. And I have to say my own favorite building in the whole of Spain, but this, I'm afraid, is an example of the Italian influence, namely the great palace that Charles V built in Granada. Um, I wish I could somehow link it to the Flemings, but giving a lecture without showing that, I feel, would have been unnecessary. With Charles' son, Philip II, the Italian influence, of course, accelerated. His favorite artist was the Venetian Titian. Uh, and there are many stories of his close connection with Titian and his great interest, above all, in Italian art. When he wanted his great victory at Lepanto, 
commemorated, it was the Titian that he turned. But for portraiture, for landscape, for devotional works, for those three essential elements of Flemish art, there's no question that for, the, for Philip, the devout, uh, deeply committed uh, religious figure that he was, he would still turn to Flanders. For portraits, uh, the depiction of him by Antonius Moore and of his wife too. Uh, for landscape, this is the age of, this is the age when Patinier's work becomes uh, so important here in Spain, uh, that wonderful creation of a distant landscape. You barely realize it's heaven on the left and hell on the right. When you look a little closer, marvelous linking up combination of pagan and Christian images. Um, again, this is a much bigger reproduction than the original picture itself. But it's the sort of thing that, again, now makes its presence felt uh, in S Spain, and especially when taken up by one of Patinier's obvious admirers, namely Bruegel, the great triumph of death, where again you can see the same kind of aerial view of a landscape with the distant horizon, the basic way he depicted his scene. But even in minor ways, Philip would turn to the, to the Netherlands. Here's Rodrigo de Hollanda, not exactly a major name in, uh, uh, in Flemish art, but the one who was brought in uh, when Philip was commemorating in the Escorial some of his victories. This one is of the siege of Châtelet. And above all, right next to him, when Philip went to bed at night, what did he have in his bedroom but Hieronymus Bosch? Uh, that tells you more about Philip II, I think, than almost anything else. But here, of course, the two great Bosch paintings, uh, which are uh, in the next building, uh, which Philip clearly uh, was very, very fond of. By the 16th century, by the time of certainly of Philip II, however, we're not just talking about patronage of the Flemings from above. Remember the Medina del Campo fairs. There were many people at those fairs, merchants, others. Uh, and the new great entrepot of Europe was much further south in Seville. But so even to Seville, the Flemings were coming. In the year 1553, to give you just one example, ships going from Antwerp, the main port in Flanders, to Spain and Portugal, carried four tons of paintings and 70,000 yards, or roughly meters, of tapestries. It's just an astonishing, huge amount uh, in one year alone that is being carried down from Flanders to Spain. What John II and Isabella had started, in other words, was not just some small trickle. It was a gigantic flood. It is why it is possible that the Prado should have 1,100 Flemish paintings. And in the 1540s, one half of all art exports going from Antwerp were going to Spain. And even to the New World, that's why I mentioned Seville. In 1506, it's the first record we have, 85 Flemish paintings, 85, were sent to the New World from Seville. So the influence was extending across the sea as well. Now, it is true, in the 1560s, under Philip II, the Italians begin to appear in great numbers. But not till the end of the century, not till around 1600, did they really outdo the Flemings. As late as the 25 period, 1623 to 1648, one Antwerp dealer, and we have his records, exported in those 25 years over 6,000 paintings to Spain. So the market, 
the influx, which of course now goes far beyond the court or the aristocracy, is simply enormous. And there is still a huge presence of Spanish merchants at the art markets, which have now grown up in Flanders. They're major customers and are expected. And the taste for Flemish art is clearly now at many, many levels of the society. And it is not clearly something that locals in Flanders were buying. It was being sent great long distances. So it is not too surprising that the attraction to Flanders reasserted itself in the reigns of Philip III and IV. And this is where I will end my story. It's a much better known story. It's not clearly because of the rise of the influence of the Italians as central, as remarkable perhaps as it was during the previous two centuries. But it is there nevertheless. The Duke of Lerma was a great, great collector of Spanish art. But his most famous portrait was done not by a Spaniard, but of course by Rubens. Rubens actually never met him, didn't matter. He created a masterpiece, which is, again, just across the way, uh, a masterpiece nevertheless. And the presence of Rubens is crucial during those early years of uh, Philip III's reign. He makes a brief visit, but a visit which has this consequence. And then when we move to Philip IV, of course, Rubens is going to come back. But so too are the other Flemings who now are such favorites. I'll show you just a couple of examples. Here's Anthony van Dyck, the crown of thorns, and very, very different Franz Snyder's fruit basket, uh, the range of Flemish art and the range of the appreciation for it in Spain is quite, quite uh, broad, uh, is quite extensive, uh, is absolutely unmistakable. But above all, the last chapter is, of course, dominated by Rubens. And here again, the numbers tell just a little bit of the story. Just as I said before, you can't study Flemish art without coming to the Prado. You, you can't even begin to study Rubens unless you come here. There are 115 works by Rubens in the Prado. It is just an amazing number. That number alone would tell you something about the pervasiveness of the Flemings here in Spain. And I can give you just a very brief taste. Uh, go across the way and look at them for yourselves. Uh, the early Immaculate Conception. And if you compare that with the early Velasquez Immaculate Conception, you can just see why Velasquez and Rubens got on so well together. There's a, an almost natural affinity between the two, between the greatest Flemish and the greatest Spanish artist of this generation. Uh, the traditions of Flemish art that are still visible here in this wonderful holy family, the colors, the sense of feeling of emotion, the depiction of the people, uh, it's no surprise that someone in Spain wanted to have that. Um, and um, uh, the judgment of Paris, uh, the love of uh, myth, of, uh, of uh, ancient history, of stories from the Greeks and the Romans, uh, which of course is something that will be taken up to such powerful effect by Velasquez later on. Uh, and of course, if you wanted a portrait, not only the Duke of Lerma, but the Cardinal Infante Ferdinand, who else was going to paint you uh, as the great victor of the Battle of Nerdlingen? Uh, if not Rubens. But Rubens also is loved for those ordinary uh, daily scenes that the Flemings were such masters of, uh, the wonderful peasant's dance, uh, which is, again, something you need to go see directly in person. Uh, and finally, the great allegory, the garden of love, uh, the depiction really of 
bits of Rubens' his own house, uh, his own household, uh, and the implication of the possibility and the beauty of love all around. So I guess, given this history, that it's not so surprising that 1,100 Flemish paintings should have ended up in the Prado, and of course that there are so many others elsewhere in Spain. I have to say that as we look at the notion of the geo-history of art, uh, as I've uh, described it, Spain has to be the prime example, not of a blurring of distinctiveness, not of a wish to take away from the individuality and the special character of local or uh, specific traditions, but rather of a culture that was always, for a very, very long time, ready to embrace traditions both distant and local. I think if we look at the Flemings in Spain, I think we see here in the Iberian Peninsula the first genuinely European culture. Thank you very much. <laughs>